Hello and welcome back to the four books of Confucian learning. My name is Kelly. Catherine and I are truly grateful for this opportunity to explore with you the four books. Now today we'll continue to look at the Analects and we're actually up to the fourth passage of the opening chapter. So let's take a look together at the fourth passage. Master Zeng said, I evaluate myself on three points every day. Have I been faithful in working for others? Have I been trustworthy in interacting with friends? Have I practiced the teachings I transmit? Now, Master Zeng, we come across him many times throughout the Analects. You're probably wondering, who is Master Zeng? Well, Let's take a look. His name is Zeng Shen, and he was alive between the years 505 to 436 before the Common Era. He has a formal name, Zi Yu, and you could say that Master Zeng is actually one of the most prominent students of Confucius. He started learning from Confucius, became a student of Confucius when he was 16. At the time, Confucius was about 62, so there's, there was a 46-year age difference between him and Confucius. His father, known as Zeng Die, or Zeng Si, was also a student of Confucius. Now, Master Zeng is credited with transmitting much of the teachings of Confucius. For example, um, Confucius imparted his teachings and Master Zeng, as recorded in the classic The Family Reference. And it is traditionally thought that he compiled or um, put together the highest learning, the text we've covered in recent weeks. Now, Master Zeng was also a teacher of um, Confucius's grandson, Zi Si, and this is through this role that he was given the title of Ancestral Sage in the Confucian tradition. Now, Master Zeng actually survived Confucius by four decades. Um, he came to be a much revered teacher in his own right. And one of his students, likely, was the teacher of Mencius. Uh, Mencius, whose name um, became the title of the next book that we'll cover in the four books. And we'll talk more about Mencius when we look at that text. So that's Men Master Zeng or Zeng Zhu in a nutshell. If we go back to the passage now, here the Analex gives us the key to Master Zeng's success. I evaluate myself on three points every day. So Master Zeng, he reflects on himself daily. There are three points to his personal reflection. I'm going to cover the first and third points briefly, and then we'll focus on the second point for the rest of today's talk. So the first point is, have I been faithful in working for others? What's the relationship between a leader and subordinate? As the subordinate or employee, one is to be dutiful, um, faithful in serving our leader or employer. Now, interestingly, the Chinese character for faithful or loyal here, um, is actually made up of the character for center and the character for mind. We have the character for the center at the top and the character for mind at the bottom. Now, put together, the character for center is about getting things just right. And it's a bit like when we're baking something. We don't want it to be burnt, obviously, but neither do we want it to be overcooked. It's this idea of getting it just right. Now, if we um, think about the idea of faithfulness or um, 
this idea of just right, and then we combine that in the work environment or the work context. The idea of faithfulness shouldn't be about what I think or what you think, but it's about doing what's appropriate, you know, for the organisation um, as a whole, what's in the best interests of the organisation as a whole. Now, the Chinese character is often translated as faithfulness, loyalty, centrality, or doing one's best. So, importantly, this concept of centrality is about not being biased towards any side. For example, um, you know, my self-interest or your self-interest, um, but trying to navigate the middle path, um, the path that's free from personal bias, sort of taking into account the greater interest or the common good according to the standards of the sages who are revered as the most enlightened thinkers. Now, for example, I could do my job carelessly, you know, and that might seem to be in my selfish interest because I don't have to put in as much effort, and um, you know, I could have a lot of spare time to surf the net. But that's not being faithful uh, in working for others, is it? On the other hand, let's say I'm an auditor or an, an accountant, and my boss pressures me to um, present false financial information in, you know, to boost the company's reputation. Should I simply do what my employer wants? You know, would I be faithful to my boss to do that? Well, just as family reverence or serving our parents doesn't involve blind obedience, serving our leader or employer isn't just doing whatever they say. I mean, you know, corporate for fraud is a, a crime and I could be imprisoned for the company directed managers. Um, you know, the whole company could be closed down which would be disastrous for all the employees, the customers, and the shareholders alike. So clearly, this idea of getting things just right, being faithful, doing our best, involves, um, involves some thought. So I guess that's where the, the mind element comes in. Now to help illustrate this concept of faithfulness, let me share with you a historical account um, relates to TC. TC is actually an elderly commandant of the Central Army in the state of Jing. This account comes from the The year is before the Common Era, a very long time ago. And the elderly TC, he applies to retire on account of his old age. Incidentally, the, the image here on the slide um, is a fragment from a manuscript, a commentary on this text, the Draw Zor Tradition of Commentary to the Spring and Autumn Annals. Now, TC applies to retire on account of his old age. And the state fuller asks TC, you know, who would be, if he could recommend someone to take over from him when he retires. Without hesitation, TC um, recommends his enemy, Xie Hu, someone he doesn't get along with. But he obviously thinks that Xie Hu is very capable, you know, could do, would be the best for that job. And so he willingly puts him forward. Unfortunately, Xie Hu passes away before he's appointed to the position. And so TC is asking else. And this time, he recommends his son. Um, and his son is then appointed. Now, around that time, um, TC's um, one of his deputies, his subordinate, Yang Shi Zhi, uh, passes away. And the state ruler asks TC to recommend someone to take up that role. And TC comes back and uh, recommends the son of Yang Shi Zhi. Now, all of the referrals prove to be capable, and TC is known for faithfully and impartially recommending talent 
for the public service. In this text, it's another classic called the Zor Tradition of Commentary to the Spring and Autumn Annals. Um, the historian uh, sort of praises TC along with uh, but that wasn't about getting into his good books. TC establishes his own son in office, but that wasn't about favoritism. And TC nominates his um, an associate, but that's not that wasn't about forming factions at all. TC was simply being faithful to his state and his employer. And he exemplifies the first aspect of the you know the three points of Master Zeng's daily reflection. Have I been faithful in serving my leader or employer? Have I accorded with the principles? Even if others aren't fulfilling their duties, have I been diligent and conscientious in fulfilling mine? Now, that's the first point. Have I been faithful in serving, um, serving others, especially my leader or employer? As for the third point for reflection, Master Zung said, have I practiced the teachings that I transmit? Now, this highlights the connection between learning and putting what we've learned into practice. It's only through putting things into practice that our knowledge becomes more thoroughly understood and then ultimately able to be passed on to others. Now, just because we might have spoken with others about what we've learned doesn't mean that we've successfully passed on that knowledge. And this particularly applies in the Confucian context, in Confucian learning. So other people will only be able to learn from, um, learn from what we've learned if we ourselves have walked the talk. So that's the third point of reflection. Have I walked the talk? Have I practiced the teachings that I transmit? As for the second point of for reflection, have I been trustworthy in interacting with friends? Now, have I been honest with my friends? When they're in need of help or advice, can they trust and depend on me? Um, have I set a positive example for my friends? In our daily interactions with friends, can they know or learn how to be a good friend? Or at the very least, hopefully not pick up any of our bad habits. Now, the other day, I actually read that, uh, read a plaque, and the plaque stated, friends are life. I thought, in this one sentence, it sort of beautifully captures um, the fact that friends are so important, they're so essential um, to, to us in providing you know, warmth and light in our lives, the warmth of kindness and compassion in the light of wisdom. Now, it's being said that friends are the family that we get to choose. So let's now take a look at what the Analex has to say about friendship based on the words of Confucius and his students. When we think of friends, we think of the good times, the laughs, the joy. But what really makes a friendship? What should we look for in a friend? And how can we be a good friend? I think these questions are as interesting to us as they were to Confucius and his students over 2,000 years ago. In Confucian philosophy, friendship is a very important category of relationship. You know, friends are important to our health and well-being. But Confucius would also say that friends can help us realise our innate goodness. Now, there's a depth to this relationship. Friendship in the Confucian context um, is more than an ordinary acquaintance. You know, there's some aspect of the relationship where we help each other practice virtue and develop virtue. And these sorts of friends trust each other 
not each other well enough to value honest feedback and advice. Now, there's a well-known story about Su Shi, who lived in the 11th century. This was a period of time Given the government's sponsorship of what was learning at the time, um, many Confucian scholars like Su Shi would um, learn from Buddhist masters. They would also learn from the Buddhist teachings. Now, Su Shi prided himself on his broad learning, and he was good friends with a Buddhist master named um, Master Buddhist Master or Venerable Huo Yin. One time, Su Shi wanted to show off his progress in personal cultivation. He wrote a poem. And this in this poem, he expressed that he had attained the stage or the level of being able to remain unmoved in face of the eight winds. And the eight winds is a Buddhist term. And it sort of refers to the eight conditions that would prevent someone from progressing along the path to enlightenment. The eight winds actually refer to prosperity, decline, honour, disgrace, praise, censure, pleasure and suffering. Well, you'll notice that half of this list actually refers to you know, positive conditions. Now, people are naturally inclined towards uh, the pursuit of prosperity, honour, praise and pleasure. Unfortunately, under these favourable conditions, it becomes all too easy to you know, become complacent and then fear into excess, which stops us from progressing along the moral path. At the same time, people can get caught up with their aversion to decline, disgrace, censure, and suffering. So Su Shi wrote his poem to indicate that he could remain unmoved in face of the eight winds. And he sent his poem to Master Fu Yin. In reply, the master wrote one Chinese word, which in English means flatulence, and sent his reply right back. On receiving the master's response, Su Shi was so incensed by the seemingly offensive remark that he set off right away to see the master. When he arrived, Master Fu Yin was um, away, happened to be away in another town, but he had left a short note for Su Shi at the gate. The note read, unmoved by the eight winds, but affected by a small fart. Obviously, Su Shi and Master Fu Yin were such close friends that the master could anticipate Su Shi's reaction. He could pr predict that Su Shi would get so upset that he would immediately you know, set out crossing the river to demand an explanation from the master in person. All the master needed to do was to leave a short note to remind Su Shi to stop kidding himself. The relationship was strong enough that the master could test him. The master could criticise him and encourage and exhort him to do better. Now, it's these sorts of friends that can help keep us grounded. They can burst our bubbles of conceit and complacency and they can help remind us of what's really important, where we need to improve. These friends are worth their weight in gold because they can help us perfect ourselves on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, friends are there to lend an ear or lend a hand in our hour of need. They tell us what we need to know when we need to know. They're not just there to make us feel good about ourselves or flatter us all the time. Instead, they're there to keep our thoughts on the right track, help us realise where we've gone wrong and how we can bring out our full potential. Now, this might be, you know, it might not be something we've thought about before, but friendship is actually one of the five fundamental relationships in our life. Think about it. 
everyone, regardless of where they're from. Um, we're bound to have friends because no person is an island. Of the five relationships, we have three that arise within the family. The relationship between spouses, uh, between parent and child, and between siblings. They arise within the family household. And in addition, there are two other relationships that arise outside the family. And that's the relationship between leader and subordinate and the relationship between friends. Now, in the Confucian context, there's a sort of a natural hierarchy built into the roles of leader and subordinate. But friendship is among equals. So friends aren't necessarily defined by family or work, but you obviously have to be associated with a friend in some way. Is it just about attending the same school or working at the same place? It's obviously a bit more than that. It's also more than sharing the same interests because, for example, not everyone who enjoys tennis are great friends. So the first question is, what makes a friendship? Now in the analects, them would tell us that an exemplary person meets with friends through cultural refinement. With these friends develops their humanity. Based on the historical context, what Master Zung is probably talking about is in refining ourselves or um, improving oneself through the learning of ritual, manners, standards and principles that we find in the classical texts that are traditionally attributed to the sages, the most enlightened thinkers. In today's world, this would be coming together as equals to learn from one another and to share ideas that can help each other improve in the cultivation of ethical character and perhaps even benefit others as well. We can see that the scope is very broad. It could be a conference, or it could be sitting down to a cup of tea um, to discuss views and ideas on our learning and practice in character character cultivation. Now, it's said that an exemplary person meets with friends. And this meeting is a meeting of mind. That's the association that we are talking about, where two people are committed to helping one another to become um, better human beings. You know, friends engage with one another to help each other do better. They do so by perfecting their own knowledge, um, setting a good example, and learning and practice. If you think about it, it's often through our friends, what they say, their conduct, that we discover our strengths and weaknesses. Now, friends should share the same aspirations. And key to this is the cultural refinement bit. And we find this, that this is inherent in the Chinese terms used to describe good friends. For example, which means sharing the same aspirations, walking along the same path. Or a zhizi, there's someone who understands us. Or a dream, someone who knows our inner thoughts, our inner voice. So, it's not about what our friends wear, um, where they live, or even their financial status or career. Friends should be linked by the shared aspirations of cultural refinement. Now, these sentiments actually echoed in the Mencius. And in that text, Mencius is asked by a student, Wan Zhang, about friendship, to which Mencius replies, in making friends with others, don't rely on the advantage of age, position, or powerful relations. In making friends with someone, you do so because of their virtue, and you mustn't rely on any advantages that you might possess. The man just makes it clear that friendship shouldn't be based on power or prestige. And this is because those sorts of friends tend to be self-serving, uh, self-interested, and thereafter, power and privilege. 
But virtuous friends, on the other hand, they have your best interests at heart. They're sincerely, you know, they're willing to sincerely try to help you progress along the path of moral cultivation. Now that's why Confucius is adamant that we associate with those who will help us develop and achieve the virtue of humanity. In the analysts, Zi Gong, another of Confucius' students, Zi Gong asked how to achieve humanity. Confucius replied, a craftsman who wishes to do good work must first sharpen their tools. In whatever country that you find yourself, offer your services to the most virtuous ministers and befriend scholars who cultivate humanity. Now, while Zagong was a student of Confucius, um, he became a diplomat in the state of law, which is where Confucius comes from. He also became a very successful merchant. And that's a bit of background to Zagong. In response to his question, Confucius first uses an analogy. Um, the analogy of a craftsman having to transform sort of raw material, like wood or stone, um, into something useful and valuable. As Confucius said, a craftsman who wishes to do good work must first sharpen their tools. Now, to shape the stone or work on the wood, the craftsman will often have to use tools made of different materials. And if you think about it, the work that Confucius is really referring to is about sharpening or refining our moral selves, you know, helping us realise this innate virtue of humanity. The virtue is inside of us, just like the jade lies waiting inside the, the raw jade stone. Like the diamond in the rough, the raw jade stone um, has to be cut and carved and polished. Now, we have to make the most of our conditions. Um, that's everything around us, including our environment, the people around us, and also the time that we have on this planet. And whatever we do, we learn to make the most of our conditions. Um, we use our conditions as the resources to perfect ourselves and realise our moral excellence. Confucius then draws our attention to two key aspects of our conditions. The first is our work. Now, often virtuous ministers. We want to ensure that our work is fulfilling that our employer um, shares our aspirations towards moral excellence. And that's why um, Confucius advises to serve the virtuous ministers. They're the ones who have the, the interests of the state, the interests of the people at heart. Now, work is obviously a fundamental part of our lives, but outside of work, they're our friends. We want to spend our time with those scholars who cultivate humanity. We want to be friends with those of moral excellence who are also keen to improve their character. Now, you might be wondering, what, how do we look for those people? What characteristics might those people have? How do we go about identifying them to be friends with them? Well, Confucius said in the NLX, there are three types of friends. There are three types of friends that are constructive and another three types um, that are destructive or harmful. There are befriending the straightforward, the understanding, and those who are well informed, they're the constructive or beneficial friends. Befriending the hypocrites, the sycophants, or the glib talkers. Those are the destructive or harmful friends. Now, Professor Li Bingnan explains that beneficial friends need not be talented or rounders. You know, we obviously can't expect anyone to be perfect. As long as 
they possess one or more of the, the three qualities they're straightforward, understanding, and or well informed, they're a friend to have. Now, what do we mean by straightforward friends, understanding friends, and well informed friends? Well, straightforward friends are you know, upright and sincere, they're open and honest, they wouldn't take advantage of us, but even if they are direct or they speak quite directly, they're also considerate. So that's the straightforward or upright friends. Then there are the understanding friends. They're considerate in forgiving. They don't hold grudges, nor are they strict in demanding. And that's important because you know, we should also learn from those traits and having them around gives us the role models to emulate, to follow. So that's the understanding friends. And last but not least, the well-informed friends. And these are people who have broad knowledge and learning. They're open-minded and very knowledgeable, resourceful, and yet not obsessive or fixated. Learning from well-informed friends can help broaden our perspective and our understanding of the world around us. So the constructive friends are straightforward. Or they're well informed. One or more of those three. Now, there's a story of a high official by the name of uh, Saul. Saul was their surname, and they lived during the Song Dynasty. And from the Song Dynasty. And on the slide is a map of um, Song China. Now, let's call this person Officer Saul. Officer Saul submitted a memorial to the formal written advice to the throne and sort of set out his recommendations on various state matters, as was his duty as a, a good official. But unfortunately, his recommendations were ignored. But not only were they ignored, Officer Saul was also demoted for his troubles. He was banished to a role in the provinces far from the capital. On the way to his new job, he was stopped by a former friend, um, a friend, and he complained to his friend that he was unfairly demoted and banished by the court when he had served the court with you know, nothing but the utmost sincerity and faithfulness all of these years. Well, on hearing about this, his friend said to him, at the time you submitted your memorial, were you acting in the interests of the people? Or were you more concerned about your career advancement? If you were acting in the interests of your of the people of the state, then you should, you know, cheerfully head on to your new role. But if you were more concerned about your career, then this demotion would count as like punishment. Now those words got through to Officer Saul and he realised that he had the wrong attitude. He stopped feeling sorry for himself. He also stopped harbouring resentment towards the court. So you could say that his friend helped him keep his thoughts on track. His friend, to me, sounds like someone who is well-informed, certainly experienced enough to you know, have a bit more perspective and straightforward enough uh, to offer um, uh, you know, direct advice. Now, there are also three types of harmful or disruptive friends. There's the, the hypocritic, hypocritical friends. You know, they say one thing and do another. They're misleading and deceptive. They pretend to be better than they are and oftentimes they get away with it because they're so good with words and they're also good at flattering others. That's the hypocritical friends. And then the, the sycophantic friends. Now they're the charmers. They make us think that we're excellent even when we're not. And chances are that we might even believe them. So we'll never improve. 
or even worse, some people could become arrogant and then it's you know, just a downward spiral from there. People lack the motivation to improve because they think that they're already the best or close enough. So that's the danger with the sycophantic friends. And finally, the glib talkers. They're the people who speak so confidently and are so good with words that they can win any argument, even when it's unreasonable. Now, I've coloured the, the harmful or the destructive friends in red as a bit of a warning. As we can see, the common denominator is that these destructive friends are persuasive speakers. And it's easy to be around those who seem to know the right thing to say. But what, I guess, makes them constructive or destructive, beneficial or harmful, ultimately lies in their motive, their intentions. Are their intentions selfless or selfish? Now, as we know, the deeds of wave also points out, well, it's in the next slide, before we get to that, Given that we spend a lot of time with our friends, we can easily pick up on their habits for better or worse. It often happens subconsciously, and that's part of the danger. Just as we often don't notice the fragrance or the smell after spending a while in an indoor garden, or the odours of a fish shop. As the Chinese saying goes, friendship with the virtuous. It's like entering a room of irises. Friendship becomes undetected with time. Friendship with the non-virtuous is like entering a fish shop. The odour becomes imperceptible with time. So it's important to take care with the company that we keep. And as the de deeds of way points out, um, you no, know, not all human beings are the same. Only few of us are kind and virtuous. If we associate with and learn from people of great virtue, and like the uh, constructive friends, we'll benefit greatly. Day by day, our own virtues will grow and our faults will lessen. But if we don't associate and learn from these people, and we associate with the destructive friends instead, well, they'll be suffering a great loss. We'll attract people without virtue, so more harmful friends, and nothing we do will succeed. So you can see how the analytics fills in some of the details, um, the details that are sort of obviously missing from the much abbreviated deeds of way. What's important to remember is that to be able to identify and attract constructive friends in the first place, we have to be the friend that we would wish to have. And this is particularly emphasized in the next passage from the Analex. Confucius said, faithfulness and sincerity as first principles. Don't have friends with aspirations that differ from oneself. And don't be afraid to change our faults. Now, the traits of faithfulness and sincerity are emphasised throughout the analects with respect to various roles, you know, whether as the leader, or subordinate, or a child or a friend. And here it's talking about students generally, being conscientious in learning and being sincere in our practice, even if others aren't learning or practicing. The more we learn and practice, the more we develop our innate virtues, the more faith we have in the texts, and the more confidence that we have in ourselves and our innate potential for goodness. At the start of our practice, though, we need to make sure that we have a good environment, people who will encourage us along the path of our moral cultivation rather than obstruct our progress. And having friends with the traits that we're trying to achieve, the same aspirations towards faithfulness and sincerity, 
Um, well, that's obviously quite important to consolidate our learning. Now, it's probably easy to think of our physical selves. So, for example, sincerity might be, do we really want to get fit and healthy? Would be our New Year's resolution. And then faithfulness would be, well, do we keep at it with um, our healthy choices in our food, our diet and exercise? Do we you know, keep at it and see things through? So that's sincerity and faithfulness in relation to our physical selves. And we apply the same principles to our moral selves. And we can either have friends who help or hinder. So that's where it's especially important to be able to identify those constructive friends. Now, people might ask, well, why do we often find ourselves in an environment or around people who are not sincere or not trustworthy? Well, if we reflect, like Master Tsung, if we reflect on ourselves, um, we'll find that it's often because of our own poor habits and our failure to focus on our goals and aspirations you know, in, in the context of our moral cultivation. And when we reflect and realise our faults, that's where the next part comes in. Don't be afraid to change our faults, being fearless and correcting ourselves. Now, constructive friends are particularly beneficial in this respect because they provide positive role models. Seeing their kind words and good deeds shows us how to improve. And obviously, if we see them do something wrong, rather than judging others, we can simply reflect on ourselves and take extra care not to make the same mistake, misjudgment. As we know from the deeds of Gwei, when we see the goodness of others, we should encourage ourselves to learn from them. Even if we're far behind, gradually we'll achieve as they have. When we see the faults of others, we should reflect on our own behaviour. It's not about judging others. Um, if we have the same fault, we should correct it. If we don't have the same fault, we should stay alert and not make, be sure not to make the same mistake. We can also find friends in the books that we read, so in the, certainly in the people around us, but in the books that we read, and that gives us access to friends um, from the past. For example, when we read the Analects, we can reflect on the Confucius that emerges from the page. Now, would I be able to say what Confucius said? Do I really believe that he's right? If not, what's stopping me? You know, what can I change about myself? Now, the other idea that could be misinterpreted here sometimes is not having friends with aspirations that differ from ourselves. You know, does that mean we start excluding others, uh, you know, maintain a small clique? Well, let's have a look at what the students of Confucius would have to say. Zi Xia and Zi Zhang, they were both students of Confucius, and they in turn eventually had their own followers. The Analex records that the students of Zi Xia um, about you know, who one should associate or be friends with. Zi Zhang asked them in response, you know, what did your master, Zi Xia, tell you? And they replied, well, our teacher, Zi Xia, said, associate with the right sort of people. Avoid those people who are not of the right sort. Sounds pretty straightforward, doesn't it? Well, Zi, Zi Zhang offers a different perspective. He said, you know, I was taught something different. An exemplary person respects the wise and tolerates the mediocre. He praises the good and has compassion for the incapable. If I have great wisdom, whom should I not tolerate? If I don't have great wisdom, people will avoid me. On what grounds could I avoid them? So there are obviously two different perspectives here. It's clear that for both Zhang and Zixia, your friendship has a moral dimension. 
they refer to a person's character, not their position or their power. Now, how might we, how might we go about reconciling these two perspectives? Well, the Xia seems to be talking um, about a beginner, you know, providing pretty direct advice uh, to his students to be careful in choosing who they're friends with, making sure that they're the right sort of people, the virtuous types, the constructive friends. Now, the Zhang, on the other hand, is trying to develop their judgment. I suppose it's a bit like learning to cross the road. When children are first taught to cross the road, they're often taught to look out for the pedestrian crossings. You know, cross only when the signal cro to cross has sounded and you know, maybe even then to look left and right for errant cars. Um, but for adults who've you know, developed good judgment, a lot, lots more experienced, or well, they've developed the judgment of their own walking speed and the speed of moving cars, maintaining a safe distance, etc. So they don't necessarily need to uh, look for the pedestrian crossings. And they're able to navigate even the busiest roads. So, you could say that Zixia is speaking of being close to and learning from those of good character, good moral character, whereas Zhang is speaking more generally about relating to people um, generally. Most commentaries support the idea that, well, whether one should associate or avoid a friend, um, associate or avoid a friend's conduct occurs within our own minds. You know, should we follow that attitude or should we follow their, their behaviour? And after a person's decided whether they want to follow or not, then they'll know whether they want to respect or tolerate, um, praise or simply accommodate. So there's a bit more thinking involved. But I suppose both elements, both advice, um, advices of Zixia and Zhang are equally important. Now, at the end of the day, the onus is on us to be the best friend that we can be. And the analects offers a few tips here. Cool. One's asked about how to interact with friends. Friendship. And Confucius said to him, give them loyal advice and guide them tactfully. If that fails, stop. Don't expose yourself to rebuff. So friends essentially have a moral duty to guide and encourage each other you know, towards ethical conduct. At the same time, there's a moral duty to help prevent and correct each other's misconduct. As we know well from the deeds of way, by mutually encouraging one another to do good, both of us will improve. By failing to advise one another to correct our respective faults, well, our characters will diminish. Now, this is also part of being honest with our friends. As Master Tsung would say, have I been trustworthy with my friends? But if our friends don't listen to our counsel, we might find other ways to try and get through to them. It's obviously not enough to just have good advice. We need to know um, how much our friend can take. When would be the best time to proffer our advice? And they're most willing to listen. We also have to know when to stop to avoid um, straining the friendship and becoming estranged. And this is about respecting our friend's autonomy and their choice to develop at their own pace. In the analects, Zhu Yo said, you know, frequent remonstration of one's lord brings disgrace where uh, a minister might protest, criticize their ruler. Um, 
frequent demonstration brings about disgrace. Frequent reproach among friends brings about estrangement. So we want to avoid straining the friendship. Now, sometimes with some friends, just know that they won't listen. So we can try to use our actions to demonstrate our honest um, advice. To demonstrate rather than um, just talking about it. And in the Analects, we find, you know, the Lord of Wei asking Confucius about military tactics. And Confucius pretends not to know. Is that being honest? Well, being honest with friends is honesty for their sake. We know what they really need to know. Another student, Zalu, once asked Confucius about what it takes to be learned. Now, Zalu is only nine years younger than Confucius, and he was actually um, the steward or the estate manager of, say, one of the most powerful families, uh, ruling families of the state of Lu, where Confucius comes from. Now, he asks Confucius what it takes to be learned. How does one deserve to be called a scholar? Confucius replied, be earnest, exacting, and amicable, and you may be called a scholar. Be earnest and exacting with friends, and amicable with siblings. Now, we can notice there's a clear distinction between friends and siblings. With siblings, we have to be amicable and not be too harsh or severe because we obviously want to maintain harmony and prevent discord within the family. With friends, yes, we have to be earnest and um, dedicated in helping our friends to improve. Um, but again, there's obviously a balance to strike. Um, we don't want to go too far and strain the friendship. So we want to our friend to improve, but we also we have to respect their choices. And respectfulness is something to bear in mind based on the next passage. Confucius said, Yan Ping Zhong was skilled in interacting with others. Even toward those he had known for a long time, he remained respectful. Um, Yan Ping Zhong is also known as Master Yan. And he was a, a contemporary of Confucius. He was a, an accomplished thinker, philosopher, and statesman. And he actually served as Chancellor of the State of Qi, uh, serving the court of several of its rulers. Now, Master Yen was very skillful in his interactions with others and his interpretations of the next line. Even toward those he had known for a long time, he remained respectful. Now, one interpretation is Master Yen remained respectful to his friends, um, or his friends still continued to respect him after having known him for a long while. Now, some people know their friends for you know, some time, they, they go back a long way, or they may have lost respect for them, um, become distanced or even estranged over time. You know, over time, people may become overly familiar and forget their initial good manners. It can sometimes be difficult to remain as respectful as those initial days of friendship as if, you know, we just met them. Um, especially after we've known our friends for a long time. Yet, Master Yen was able to do so. And as a result, his friends also afforded him with the same respect. So, yes, we want to um, help our friends to improve, but we don't want to overdo it. We want to, you know, be just right. Have the approach that's just right. And I suppose at the heart of all of this is the idea of being respectful, maintaining that respect throughout the friendship. So we can do a recap. Um, today we've focused on friendship as the main theme. 
And it's one of the three elements that um, Master Zeng reflects on every day. Now, have I been trustworthy with my friends? We've looked at what makes a friendship. Um, the idea that essentially it's defined by a mutual commitment to cultural refinement, improving oneself, one's moral self, but at the same time helping our, our friends uh, progress along the moral path too. And making the most of our environment, the people, all of our conditions to perfect ourselves on a day-to-day -day basis. A part of that is associating with the constructive friends. So we've also looked at you know, what to look for in a friend and the features of those constructive friends, being um, straightforward, being understanding and well-informed. So that's what to look for in a friend and ultimately how to be a good friend, being willing and able to give you know, honest, loyal advice. Um, but also part and parcel of that is being able to do so in a way that makes our friends feel comfortable and understand that we're on their side. We don't want to be overly harsh and critical, um, you know, giving them advice when they, they're just not willing to listen. A good friend should also be patient enough um, not to strain the friendship and become estranged, but to ensure that, you know, giving our, our friends the space to develop at their own pace too. Having that sort of sense of respectfulness towards our friends and their choices too. So that's what makes a friendship to look for in a friend and how to be a good friend and that on that note that brings to an end um, this talk on the analects we've looked at friendship and i hope that that's been helpful